uh, uh, hand uh, series. Uh, we are going to discuss uh, fireside chat on distal radius malunion. The faculties and moderators are as follows. I am. My name is uh, Emil Dionysian. I'm a uh, associate uh, professor at uh, Southern California uh, and at Kaiser Permanente. We will have our faculty, Marco Rizzo, uh, professor at Mayo Clinic, and of course, uh, Jesse Jupiter, our sage, who is uh, famous enough, doesn't need any introduction, but he's uh, from Harvard Medical School and currently resides uh, part-time in Florida. Uh, the, these are our disclosures. Uh, Dr. Riza and I have nothing to disclose, and Dr. Jupiter disclosed as follows here. AO North America is an independent nonprofit uh, surgical specialty society dedicated to improving the care of the patients and musculoskeletal injuries. We don't dis uh, endorse any product or promote any services. Equipment used in this uh, presentation are solely for demonstration teaching purposes. Now, AO North America is accredited by Acc Accreditation Council of Continuing Medical Education. Uh, this series altogether gives about 11 and a quarter AMA uh, CME credit. Uh, of course, you should only claim what you've uh, attended. To receive the CME, uh, you will be sent a uh, email about 24 hours after the conclusion of the series, upon completion of which you can claim your CMEs. Now, some uh, going over some Zoom etiquette. All microphones will be muted and vi video cameras will be turned off. If you have any question, please use the Q&A box. Uh, for question and answer session, I'll try to answer whatever it's possible to do, or we may leave some of the questions towards the end for discussion. The uh, moderators, as me, uh, will be me, will be reviewed the questions, that, and the uh, chat box only leave it for the uh, faculty, please. So our agenda for today is uh, I'll, I will uh, present a case uh, with the evaluation management and going over briefly about the uh, malunion treatment for distal radius. And then uh, Dr. Jupiter will bring out his experience over 40 to 45 years of experience of how to do it and the lessons that he's learned over the years. And then Dr. Rizzo will uh, present a complication case and how to navigate that. And then we'll have some time for discussion with question and answer session, and we'll adjourn uh, about a quarter after the hour. Now, learning objectives for this session is to identify radiogra radiographic indications for surgical procedures of distal radius malunion corrective osteotomy, identify and understand the clinical criteria for this surgery, define the appropriate and surgical anatomy needed for this uh, surgical and the surgical steps. Recognize the possible uh, pitfalls and the possible complication, and have a, a brief understanding of the literature about this problem. We've had already uh, several of the sessions of the fireside chats. Uh, one remaining uh, after this one, it's in December 14. I'm going to put a plug for that. That's going to be about the distal radial joint arthritis treatment with Dr. Amit Gupta as our sage. Now, uh, upcoming webinars in 2024, we have a great set of uh, webinars set up. Uh, we will still have another webinar coming uh, in, in terms of AO hand uh, for a terrible triad uh, remaining this year in uh, December 6th. And there were series, as you see, on acute fracture of the scaphoid, skin flaps, finger flaps, both bone forearm fracture, and dyserides malunion uh, next year in 2024. Remember, this, these uh, lecture series are all uh, recorded and can be uh, watched on YouTube under AOHAN North America. And also encourage you to sign up on the Ortho TV uh, and Ortho TV online for live streaming and watching further such videos. Now, just go over, uh, briefly go over the dyserius corrective osteotomy. 
Dyserytis malignant is a common problem. Generally, dyserytis fractures are about 15 to 17 percent of all fractures that happen. Malignant is not unusual. About 11 percent of them, even more perhaps, depending how you define it, there's a complications as a malunion. Not all malunions are malunions are symptomatic. Not all need treatment. But if there is a significant limitation with activity causing pain, especially ulnar sided pain because of the shortening of the radius, then some kind of a corrective osteomy may be indicated. Now, uh, malignants could be several types. It could be extraarticular, which is the most common. Then it could be intraarticular, or it can be combined. And remember, malignant can happen in multiple planes. It could be with the volar tilt, angulation. It could be a radial inclination problems. It could be radial height change and shortening. And also could be a rotational deformity. And uh, frequently, there's all three or four concepts are involved here. Now, what happens with this uh, malunion or distal radius? The change in the distal radial ulnar joint will cause problem with the um, smooth gliding and function of that joint. Once they have the joint tilted, the carpal malunion will be another problem, or sorry, malalignment. Shortening of the skeleton will cause extending muscle weakness because of the lengthening relatively. And then there's going to be a mismatch between the extending muscle of, and the intrinsic muscles. And they all uh, result in weakness. Now, indications for osteotomy are not absolute. Uh, they're all relatives. Uh, there are always possibility of complications. So when discussing with the patient, we have to look at the whole patient and look at what we can do and what is possible. Now, generally in the literature, most of the uh, indications go in the realm of dorsal tilt of more than 15 degrees, or the radial inclination as is less than 15 degrees, or if the shortening of the ulnar variants have shortened more than three to five millimeters, or is a clear ulnar carpal impaction, or is it intraarticular displacement of more than two millimeters, which tend to lead to arthritis, those are maybe a relative indications for doing a distal radius corrective osteotomy. Now, how does the mechanics work in there? Once we have discussed, we have the shortening of the radius, there's going to be a grip weakness because the relatively muscles are looser and lengthened. Whereas there's a dorsal angulation, there's a distal radial ulnar joint incongruity that will cause problem with the pronation and supination. As a result of the tilt change, there's going to be a dorsal, especially a dorsal tilt, there's a dorsal radial subluxation of the carpus, which can then result in the adaptive uh, deformity of the carpal alignment, especially a dorsal inter uh, intercalated uh, segmental instability, or DC. And excessive tilt, depending on which way, if the dorsal tilt will uh, cause decreased flexion and supination, if it's a volar tilt extension, then it's the decreased extension and pronation. Of course, the forces change. If the radius shortened, the ulnocarpal forces increase, and the estimate of you know, just two or two and a half millimeters shortening of the radius would increase the pressure on the ulna by about 40%. Now, how do we image uh, for this problem? Definitely, we want to get a contralateral x-ray to know what is the normal or theoretical normal level of the uh, original uh, alignment so that we know how much we have to be corrected. Especially getting that 25 degrees elevated lateral will allow us to see an intraarticular segment to see if there's significant step up. CT scans can be helpful, in our, especially a 3D image, so that we can know what are we dealing with, where is the maximum area of the deformity, and also uh, consider MRI if there's uh, worry about the ligamentous problem. Now, as far as surgical planning, um, this concept of uh, dorsal approach uh, initially became popular with uh, Diego Fernandez's article in 1982. At that time, we didn't have uh, locking screws. So the uh, idea was to have a cortical cancellous graft dorsally because most of the problems were dorsal malunions, 
uh, to correct it and uh, put a corticocancellous graft and the dorsal plate. Uh, once the after advent of the locking screws and the volar plating uh, uh, becoming popular, then a volar approach started to become popular. Since 2008, most of the articles about doing volar plate um, approach and volar osteotomy. Uh, of course, uh, sometimes we may do a ulnar shortening osteotomy if we cannot lengthen the radius enough or there's too much discrepancy. Sometimes we may do both radius and ulna. And uh, so, uh, the question comes what to do with the ulnar styloid. Sometimes the ulnar styloid is a large fragment, which is painful and has uh, a non-union that may, may consider doing surgery for that, if there, especially if there's instability of the dissertator ulnar joint. And also have to worry about the uh, triangular proper cartilage. If there's any injury or tear, we might want to repair at the same time we're doing the uh, osteotomy correction. The uh, surgical plan, it's important to know where the maximum or the, where the location of deformity is because you want to do the osteotomy at the location of the deformity. If you do the osteotomy somewhere else, then you're, you may develop a, what's called a Z deformity or to cause translations, which is uh, may become problematic. And also have to remember there's always a maybe a, a rotational osteo a rotational deformity we might want to correct at the same time of the osteotomy. And also think about the different planes, the coronal correction and the sagittal correction. Most fractures have component of coronal and sagittal uh, malunion in the in the deformity. Uh, as far as the uh, surgical plans, uh, uh, generally an opening wedge osteotomy allows to lengthen the uh, skeleton. And of course that uh, would cause a, a gap. And then the question comes whether we should have a bone graft or not. And, and there are different studies that shows that different kind of bone grafts can be helpful or sometimes even no bone graft as long as there's a cortical uh, abutment. And then this concept of closing with osteotomy, which allows a quicker healing of the bone, but it does shorten the skeleton somewhat. And also the question is how to reduce it. Sometimes we may use a distracted dorsally or use the plate itself as a jack and to correct the uh, malunion using the plate as in the lower picture. When it comes to complex correction, sometimes a um, intraarticular uh, visualization may be uh, helpful. Uh, sometimes there may be volar carpal subluxation uh, that we may have to correct. Uh, of course, every time you look volarly, you may disrupt the volar ligaments there, that may be need to be repaired. Uh, sometimes it's easier to dorsally look inside the joint. Star cut is important to make sure you protect the surrounding uh, tendons. Uh, it's very common to injure the extensor tendon, especially the extensor pollicis longus, which is very intimately attached to the uh, bone dorsally. Uh, be very cautious using an osteotome because it can easily cut tendons in the back. Three-dimensional three guides have been very useful. Sometimes uh, uh, they can be uh, uh, 3D printed so that give you a better estimation of where to make the cut and how to uh, do the correction. Now, as far as bone grafting, uh, I'm sure Dr. Jupiter will talk more about this, but generally, uh, first, when it was described by Diego Fernandez, 1982, dorsal bone grafts, cortical cancellous bone graft was the standard. Uh, after a while, it was shown that with a locking system, we can even use a, a cancellous graft and that would work okay. And then as late as uh, 2014, there was articles coming out that as long as you have some cortical contact, you may not even need a bone graft. This may spontaneously fill in with time itself. So here's a case example as one of our three cases. Uh, this is a 62-year-old female. It was uh, uh, fell at home and developed this uh, dissociative fracture. Of course, we try to close reduction. It looks pretty decent. Uh, the uh, radial height is relatively okay. Uh, the distillate ulnar joint is well aligned. The dorsal tilt is about uh, neutral. And of course, this went on to heal, but as happens uh, uh, frequently over time, when it heals, by the time it heals, it tends to settle. Now it's one year after. It's about uh, 
almost 30 to uh, 35 degrees of dorsal angulation and significant shortening has completely lost the radial height. It's pretty much a zero in terms of radial inclination. And uh, the ulnar styloid is broken and is non-union and is tender. Now she has ulnar wrist pain. What to do now? Of course, we offered them, uh, offer her um, osteotomy and we did the osteotomy and also uh, fixed the uh, ulnar styloid. And that helped her. It wasn't a perfect, uh, at the end of the all uh, said and done, it wasn't uh, all perfect, but she felt better. The ulnar wrist pain uh, did resolve. She still has significant uh, residual uh, uh, stiffness. In her case, we used a tricalcium phosphate bone filler and used a, a bone marrow aspirate to enhance the, uh, the healing. Fortunately, we did not have any major complication, no tendon rupture or problems. She did have problem with the hardware and we had to remove it later. So here's the her after the removal of hardware. You can see the uh, on the left was the, before the osteotomy and then right uh, after the osteotomy, we corrected the dorsal tilt and the radial height and the inclination. Now, uh, this complication as Dr. Mark Dr. Rizzo will uh, bring up, uh, you can have significant of complications. There are some reports that are up to 50% of complications. Most complications are tendon ruptures. Uh, when you're doing an osteotomy from a scarred bed, you may uh, inadvertently injure the uh, tendons, or it may spontaneously rupture after the surgery because of the lack of blood supply or attritional. Plate fractures is non unheard of. Uh, or you may still have a persistent malunion despite all the efforts to correct it. You may still have a non-union. Uh, of course, if you have a, some kind of a cortical contact, you will less of a, a less of a chance for that happen. And also, there's a patient health factor. Usually, this uh, kind of uh, malunions and, and troubles happen in patients who already are sick. There are systemic problems. Could be uh, radical, you know, some diabetes or neuropathy or uh, severe osteoporosis. So those are factors to think, keep in mind. So take home message from just this brief uh, overview. Not all malunions need osteotomy. Patient selections are important in this case. Multiple, uh, you have to think about multiple plays of deformity. Many possible complications are possible. Approach is important. And, uh, you know, in general, less distractions and less correction, you get less complication. Okay. Now, how do we going to do this? Fortunately, today we have the world famous Dr. Jupiter, who's going to help us delineate the different steps to get out of trouble. So I'm going to get my uh, share the stop the sharing. And Dr. Jupiter can continue with the, his presentation. Thank you, uh, Mio. Uh, terrific uh, overview. Let's see. Okay. And welcome, everyone. Uh, we've got a quite a interesting topic. Um, one that's becoming more. Um, prominent uh, as people are interested in a better outcome from these injuries. Uh, you've seen my disclosures, so I won't go through that. Let's see. Uh, what I'd like okay. to look at is the following uh, indications and timing and preoperative planning and look at some of the operative tactics, uh, address bone graph as mentioned, and look at some of the uh, outcomes. What about indications? Well, more than anything else, it's a functional situation. Appearance, uh, unfortunately, uh, can occur, but functional limitations is, is preeminent, and pain is the biggest thing. Even though you may look at a, a modest malunion and wonder why the patient has pain, uh, it can happen, and it's often from cartilage overload when the radiocarpal malalignment is um, sufficiently uh, abnormal. As mentioned, in, midcarpal instability can, can be present uh, by virtue of the deformity of the radius, as the radius is really the seat of the carpus. And uh, you heard about 
DRUJ problems and obviously articular incongruity. Generally, uh, advanced degenerative arthritis, radiocarpal, is probably not a good indication unless there's you're planning to do, for example, a radio car, a radio scaphoid carpal uh, uh, fusion, and uh, has a substantial deformity of the radius, so it might include an osteotomy to correct the overall alignment. Fixed carpal instabilities is important to recognize that if the patient's problem is motion, not so much pain, not so much deformity, and they have a, a fixed carpal instability, they probably won't gain motion if there's been an intercarpal ligament problem. So sometimes you need to sort that out. Decreased functional capabilities uh, and extensive osteoporosis uh, are obvious, but patients who have a good indication but have a very stiff hand or a non-compliant soft tissue, uh, it's probably not best to do it right away. You always will see patients like this who uh, come in for Dupuytren's or something else, and they've got an awful looking x-ray. They ask them, are you having any problems? No, never had problems in my life, something like that. There's something to be said about deformity, and that is we look at a three-dimensional problem in two dimensions when we look at x-rays. Furthermore, when we measure x-rays, we don't really appreciate that the true vector of deformity it may be a combination of it. One of the great advantages of approaching distal radius malunions from a Palmer approach is that you're able to pretty well correct rotation. Rotation isn't always visible to you looking at two-dimensional x-rays, but the flat plate on the flat surface of the Palmer aspect of the radius will generally correct most of the rotation, and that puts you in a better uh, way of assessing the remaining deformity. And so remember that because really all deformities, whether they're diaphyseal, metaphyseal, when we look at x-rays, we may not be seeing the true vector of the deformity, which may be a combination of these. We certainly have heard from Emil, and it's well known that if you lose the uh, alignment of the radiocarpal joint, you may transfer load uh, more uh, inefficiently either to the carpal bones or to the ulna. And when we sometimes look at an x-ray, if you look at an extension of 35 degrees, look at the way the lunate and capitate have adapted. And this is an adaptive um, malunion. And if you correct the deformity, it will correct the um, mid-carpal uh, problems. And these pa patients may come in with pain or clicking or um other issues about weak uh, grip, uh, whatever, so that uh, be careful about this because the problem may be if you have a fixed carpal malalignment where there's been intercarpal ligament problems and you correct the malunion of the radius, you may not correct the uh, carpal problems. And by shortening, it's a relative shortening, you increase uh, the loading on the ulnar side. And this can be a, a, a big problem in uh, promoting pain moving from the wrist to the distal radial ulnar joint. Years ago, we, we suggested that two millimeters step up. It was a very bad article, I have to tell you. Uh, uh, if you read a subsequent article that we wrote in J JBJS about a retraction, uh, was a lot of the ways we measured was really in 1980s. We're not using uh, CTs and whatever, but the, the observation was correct. Um, and we know that uh, positioning the end of the radius abnormality, uh, abnormally, will lead to problems with the flexor tendons, weakened grip, and whatever. On the Palmer side, uh, a malunion is almost always associated with a uh, supination contractor. Patients have a lot of trouble rotating uh, by that. When to do this? 
Well, for years, we thought, well, we should allow the patient to rehabilitate the hand, which is appropriate, and then to get as much they could get out of therapy. And sometimes this dragged on and on when you're looking at a younger person with an obvious deformity. Uh, so if in the absence of trophic changes, acceptable bone uh, quality and adequate wrist function, there's no reason to wait. And I started seeing this uh, early on, and um, it made sense to me. And uh, we looked at a series of 10 patients done early, that's within five to eight weeks post-fracture, compared to the traditional way, four to six months, when it was well healed. Uh, and this is what the observations were. It was much easier to correct the alignment. You went right into the uh, original fracture site, which sometimes is not quite obvious on the dorsal side, but very obvious on the volar side. And there was no need for structural bone graft. And uh, because you're doing it early, you certainly decrease the total disability time and patients got back to work considerably earlier. What about planning? Well, uh, you can see from deformities that uh, it's a good idea to know what you're going to do beforehand. And Emil showed this uh, original uh, concept by uh, uh, Swiss uh, Diego Fernandez, looking at it from the dorsal side and <laughs> comparing it to normal side. You can ter determine to some degree what type of osteotomy you may need, whether it's... Um, you need to lengthen or not lengthen by actually using the x-rays. Get a lateral and an AP x-ray of the normal and abnormal side. And if you superimpose the abnormal on the normal, and then draw a line connecting the volar aspect of the abnormal to the volar aspect of the normal, and then the very dorsal aspect of the uh, abnormal to the very dorsal aspect of the uh, <clears throat> normal, and then bisect those lines with perpendiculars. Where the perpendiculars interact will tell you about what, what type of osteotomy you need. So if you look at this on the top cartoon, look at the two lines intersect right at the volar side. That means that we will not need to distract the distal fragment, but rather uh, hinge it on the volar cortex. But if you look at the volar uh, uh, cartoons, if you have a situation where the lines intersect within the substance of the abnormal bone, that tells you that it's mostly a rotational malunion. And it's almost a situation where you need to correct a little bit of the volar and add somewhat of the dorsal side, but a lot of this will be corrected by a volar plate. And then if the lines intersect far outside the, the two bones, then you know you will need to uh, distract it. So, and this is the era of computer-generated preoperative planning, which is wonderful in its substance, but you can do a lot of this from x-rays. Having said that, we did a prospective randomized study looking at X-ray standard planning like I've addressed compared to 3D planning. These were for extraarticular malunions. It was published in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. And <clears throat> patient-rated outcomes were slightly in favor of 3D uh, assisted, but really not significant. So I would say for me personally, uh, the computer-generated planning may be better for intra-articular malunions. Here's one of the patients in the series with the computer planning. The, they uh, will tell you where to put the plates, screws, et cetera, give you uh, jigs to do this. And it's uh, very sophisticated and it's... Um, a little bit uh, appealing, but listening to what Emil said and what myself, you can plan a lot of this preoperatively without this. If you look at extra-articular malunions, 
The goals are this. One is we want to reorient the articular surface to allow that normal low transmission, especially that where it's been translated to the ulnar side. We'd like to reestablish normal carpal kinematics and normal distal radial ulna joint. Can you do this through a volar approach? Can you do this without sophisticated uh, three-op planning? Let me show you how. If you know to what degree you have to correct in the sagittal plane and in the frontal plane, you can use your plate to generally give you some idea of how to do the correction. By applying the plate securely to the distal fragment, recognizing they have to be careful if it's osteopenic bone because we're going to put a lot of stress on that attachment. And in the sagittal plane, you can have an idea to what degree you are going to need to correct the extension deformity to bring it back to the palmer side. And you can do this to give you some idea uh, using the plate uh, as well. Fixate the distal uh, limb of the plate. Then, once that's done, do the osteotomy. And then, as you bring your plate down, it will help correct the frontal and the, the sagittal plane as such. You, I'll show you how you can extend the distal fragment as well to gain length through this. So here's a case. <laughs> There's a drawing. Uh, it's a sig significant uh, deformity. Here's the volar approach. Here's the implant in the frontal and sagittal plane placed in a way that we believe we can correct a lot of this deformity. And then the osteotomy is done. It can be done with the plate in place if you're careful. You have to go above the dorsal surface to free up the healing periosteum uh, to allow the, the completion of the osteotomy. So now this is being done, and here it is, opened up. You, the lamina, uh, I mean the uh, elevator is dorsal that's freeing up the periosteum. And by holding the distal fragment with a plate and the proximal fragment with a pointed reduction clamp, it can be brought back together. In some cases, there's a tendency for radial translation of that distal fragment. So uh, one uh, uh, nice thing to do is put a small lamina spreader between the radius shaft and the ulna and slide over the radius back to the uh, distal fragment to control that radial translation. By putting a screw proximal to the plate, one can use a push-pull technique to then lengthen the osteotomy as such. We see on, on the x-ray. And in the, extent, in the sagittal plane, we've got a nice correction of the extension deformity filled with just cancellous bone and uh, follow-up uh, uh, function. Uh, this can be done very nicely uh, without the need for these cortical cancellous grafts. But it going from the dorsal surface, it's not always necessary to use big plates. The smaller plates work very well. But the difficulty in some cases is correcting the rotational deformity, and that's what you have to work on. Intraarticular malunions um, can be done. It, it's most important to understand the deformity. Having the original fracture films are ideal. Having CT scans are ideal to do this. It will depend on the cartilage. If the cartilage is very damaged, it may not be a good idea. Chronology has always been thought with intraarticular malunions to the earlier the better, which makes sense. But we found that um, it may not be the case. If you see somebody at a year's time, you still can do something as long as the cartilage hasn't been worn out. And of course, the soft tissue conditions. Here, CT scans and maybe 3D reconstructions will be very helpful. And with situations where you're worried about an interarticular uh, uh, arthrosis or ligament problem, 
uh, arthroscopy may be good. I think the contraindications are pretty obvious uh, uh, when you're looking at um, uh, contemplating doing these procedures, so I won't go through these. Simple intraarticular disruptions, if you're going to start doing this, are probably better. Probably better do it sooner. And um, a cooperative patient uh, is important because it may take longer to rehabilitate than than a regular fracture, and they may think that. <clears throat> well, you do have radiocarpal arthrosis. Uh, limited fusion may be better. So let's look at that. And here's a case looking at a very complex uh, deformity. This is from the uh, studies done early on with the 3D computer planning. And you see the uh, deformity. It will give you an idea of the plane of the deformities, give you an idea of where to do the osteotomy. And then uh, it's almost reconstructing or recreating the original fracture and then putting your uh, implant in, in place and a nice uh, reconstruction. That looks good, but it's a lot more complicated than that. Paco de Pinel in Spain has been very enthusiastic and very uh, technically gifted in doing some of these totally arthroscopically. He's developed small elevators and osteotomes to be able to do this, and this was done in this particular patient that he lent me. As mentioned, sometimes you may have a combined uh, malunion. This is a general surgeon I saw many years ago with an intra and extra articular deformity. And we were able to get um, CAD CAM models exactly of the deformity and the uninjured side and do our preoperative planning uh, in the workshop. And here you can see the extension deformity and importantly, the rotation. You can see from the normal to the abnormal in the coronal section. And so I, I emphasize again that rotation is often associated with these deformities. And by doing this preoperatively, it seemed apparent that we could elevate the impacted lunate facet and elevate the extra articular malunion. And he had to have the plate out later, but um, he had a very a functional risk for a surgeon. Here's another case that you can reconstruct the uh, uh, original fracture from the deformity. And it it's actually a little easier than doing the original fracture. So the osteotomy initially is done in the impacted lunate facet fragments, realigned, and then extra-articulate. Uh, uh, the, the osteotomy is made and uh, in this case, uh, some cortical cancerous bone graft was placed was a number of years ago. But this is a follow-up uh, uh, on this 11 years later uh, with an uh, excellent function. You heard mentioned bone graft. I won't spend a lot of time with this. There's a lot of different options. But I found once, as Emil mentioned, once we had locking capability for implants, there was no need to have a structural graft. And so we looked at a, another cohort of 10 patients compared with uh, traditional cortical cancellous graft versus cancellous graft. And there was certainly less donor site problems, less pain, and um, shorter operation. And so I think that in most cases, uh, you don't really need these unless you have unstable fixation. Uh, uh, then that may be helpful. The cortical cancer graft may give you a little additional thing. And you heard about calcium cements, and I've been using those for the last 15 years. Here's a case with a, a not a very complex malunion. Uh, you can see the x-ray. And look at the extension uh, correction and the uh, in two planes, and the that's just calcium phosphate, uh, but it it hardens like structural bone. So this particular brand will harden within 12 hours, and it will withstand axial load. 
And we published a series in journal of hand surgery of this. And lastly, uh, this radio only joint, I don't have to spend much time because it's a whole other topic. We're going to, you're going to have a, a webinar on, but realize that uh, many of these are related to the malposition of the radius. Correction the malposition of the radius, again, particularly rotation, may help a lot of the uh, deformities. And complications uh, we'll hear now from Marco Rizzo. But I just want to mention one thing. Since we're doing a lot of these through a volar approach, starting to see EPL ruptures, and uh, that's because sometimes when you have a closed fracture that's not operated on, you have a lot of uh, bone growth around the uh, Lister's tubercle. And unless that's taken down, um, you may uh, realign it, but then that becomes a spike to do that. So let me just show you one case here, like such. Abundant callus uh, or a spike of bone that's not recognized can bring this uh, to play. So uh, just be mindful of that when doing a volar correction to loosen the periosteum and make sure that there's not a abundant callus there. So I'll stop my screen there, and uh, I guess we'll go on to Marco Rizzo. Jesse, thank you very much. That's just wonderful, as always. Um, there's a couple questions. So. <clears throat> And uh, Emil answered one, um, but we could try to rehash it. There's a, one that may be off topic directed to you, um, Jesse. Um, the question was related to what your thoughts were related to close reduction of acute injuries and whether that has an impact on the prognosis. And uh, I mean, welcome your, your sentiments on it. It's not really directly related to our, our subject tonight, but maybe indirectly. Well, uh, I, I, if I understand the question, mm -hmm. is is there a place still for close reduction of fractures? Is that yes? And my answer would be yes, but um, sure. it's directed to you specifically. Sure, uh, without question. Uh -huh. uh, the the time that you may need to intercede is um, if you have a, an acute median neuropathy that uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. from overcorrection or even associated with the fracture that you need to do something else about it. Uh, but um, otherwise, no, uh, the volar uh, displaced fractures may be more difficult to do a close reduction or hold it. But otherwise, no. I guess the, the, the point of the question was, if you're deciding to go, the patient needs already surgery, is it worth doing a close reduction in the emergency room? That's the question. Oh, well, uh, yes. You should realign the uh, the, uh, the the skeleton. Uh, maybe it doesn't have to be perfect, but get the soft tissues out to length. It will make uh, uh, the procedure more easily. And nobody's doing these in the middle of the night, are they? So you're going to be doing it in three to five days, maybe. So who knows what? So it's far better. It's more comfortable for the patient. I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> I think one of the attendees has their hand up. I, I didn't know that uh, if they could just type the question in the Q and A, that might be that might be helpful uh, to Bess. Um, another question from a hand therapist: Is there anything we can instruct the patient? Uh, to lessen the risk of EPL ruptures, or is it just a risk? And when you usually see EPL ruptures three to four months post-op or later, or when, when do you typically see them? Well, for acute fractures, um, more commonly than not, it's for non-displaced fractures or minimally displaced fractures. Mm -hmm. The reason is tendons rupture three ways, um, attrition or rubbing on a substance, or uh, uh, ischemia is another way. Well, that's what happens in a, a non-displaced fracture, is, list, is the extensor retinaculum over the third compartment doesn't open. 
So it gets a hematoma there. So actually, you'll probably see it earlier. You may see it as early as four weeks, six weeks, or later. Um, what to do? The patient, I, I feel, I used to tell everybody on a closed reduction, if you start having a, a grating feeling when you're moving your thumb or pain, come back. Come back. And it may be, ben you can consider a cortisone injection, but I don't think it's worthwhile. Just a, a small release of the retinac is probably better. So the therapist can uh, tell the patient, reinforce that. Thank you, Jesse. Awesome. Nice pearls. Uh, additional question. Um, are you freeing the dorsal periosteum from the, I saw from your pictures, you tend to free it from the volar approach. You just come along the sort of, um, sort of the Orbe method of sort of the extensile approach dorsally. How often do you make a separate approach on the dorsal or make a separate incision dorsally? Well, um, some colleagues will do that routinely. Mm -hmm. Um, and so to release list of tubercle. But I think if you see an abnormality there when you're reducing it, you see a bone spur or a very prominent list of tubercle, I think it, you might want to go around it or even make a second approach. The point is, um, think about it because um, it's usually not the screw going through the plate uh, in injuring the tendon, it's yeah, it's uh, an attrition that's going back and forth over a rough surface. Um, last question for now. Um, Jesse, do you ever not use bone graft? If you have a, a that so called hinge uh -huh. situation, uh, yes, uh, you could, but. Uh, because I've been using uh, calcium phosphate type graft, it's no morbidity to the patient. So the patient feels better and I feel better, makes a better x-ray. When they come back and see the gap there, they say, what's going on? No, I, and it's no, no morbidity. Uh, so it, it has worked very well in my hands. Okay. And now... Okay. All right. So I, I'm going to round us out here, share the screen. Um, thank you for all the questions, everyone. Thank you for your participation. Of course, Emil, thank you so much, as uh, as well as uh, Jesse. It's so wonderful to hear your your uh, your ex experience and expertise, and thanks for sharing that. I hope you can all see this okay. Um, yes. I'm going to uh, maybe hide myself a little bit here. So... Uh, you know, the third case in the series is usually directed towards complications, um, and uh, thankfully I have plenty of them to share with you. So, um, this is a 74-year-old uh, female who had multiple comorbidities, uh, diabetes, um, former smoker, uh, probably still smoking, um, pulmonary disease, cardiac disease, and uh, obesity. And uh, she uh, she presents with this fracture, which, uh, to their credit, they tried to do uh, a close reduction, um, and um, subsequently followed up, which unfortunately happens all too often. Uh, they'll see them back a month later or six weeks later, and uh, she's lost her reduction with substantial owner owner shortening. Um, uh, they uh, continued with non-operative treatment, and ultimately, at three months post-fracture, she had, uh, was left with this. And unfortunately, she complained of a, a good amount of ulnar-sided wrist pain and uh, pain in general at the wrist. And uh, they ultimately uh, did perform this uh, uh, distraction uh, volar uh, correction osteotomy with iliac crest bone grafting. Um, I guess at this point, I'm going to probably engage uh, Jesse. Uh, uh, what do you uh, What do you think of the correction? How would you How would you grade this correction? Uh, well, I, uh, it's very hard to do that, but mm -hmm. I think um, it's still uh, radially translated the distal fragment. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. so you may have some DRUJ problems, and um, while 
being overly critical, it's <clears throat> it's a little bit in neutral and not volatile. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So it, uh, it may be a little a little difficult. I, I think uh, you you highlight um, some really good points, and I think these are challenging procedures, particularly in patients with poor bone quality. You know, uh, trying to get them jacked out, and you know, a lot of the pearls that Dr. Jupiter shared were were outstanding. But uh, we we technically here in this case, and and again, this wasn't my case yet, um, but. Uh, Failed to really get the the radial line, the length out, but that wasn't too too bad. It was an, it was a heroic effort, I have to say. Um, and they did structurally support it with bone graft. Um, and I wasn't sure if the DRJ was assessed, but that gap between the radius and ulna is a bit potentially concerning. Emil, you had commented about the ulnar styloid. What's your criteria in a case like this to to treat the ulna side? Uh, uh, how do you determine when to treat, when not to treat? That's a good question, actually, as one of the uh, uh, participants asked that question. Mm -hmm. you, how do you address the ulna, especially in the case where the pain is in the ulnar side? You have an ulnar side of uh, a non-union. Uh, is it worth taking the styloid out, or is it do go, good to go and fix it? I tend to, if I, if I feel a specific tenderness mm -hmm. at the ulnar styloid, I tend to address it. Uh, uh, and usually I, I do a little tension band technique to hold it down and usually been successful in terms of getting that to heal. And also depends on the instability. If there's instability in addition, then you are worried about TFCC problems. And That's I may get an MRI ahead of time or try to look at it at the time of surgery. She needs that if, if whether that needs to be addressed and you know, maybe a suture to hold it down. That's an excellent point, uh, Neil. You know, you don't know until, interestingly, uh, many of these do have preoperative DREJ sort of laxity, if you will, and they tighten up, but sometimes it's the opposite way. You know, they, they're pretty tight when you start, and when you do the correction, they, they get loose. And so I've learned to counsel patients that I may have to do something here, whether it be stabilizing or whether yeah. it be fixing uh, or shortening or whatever, something that may be necessary to be done at the time of the, uh, the correction of the radius. You know, at that at that uh -huh. level, at the, just the distal level, that uh, the inner osseous ligaments are oblique from radius down to the ulna. So when you lengthen the radius, usually it tightens up, and and and, um, and you increase the stability of the distal ulnar joint. Oh, and Jesse, you wrote a lot about this. The the, the DOB. Uh, what, how did you? How do you interpret, or how do you prophesize, if you will? What's going to happen when you correct the radius in these patients? Have you had that experience where sometimes they're not quite as tight as you thought they if were? You, if, if you correct your radius, mm -hmm. uh, or you, and same in acute fractures, you stabilize it, then what you need to do is reconstruct the, what happens physiologically. And that's by compressing the radial, uh, the ulnar head into the sigmoid notch and rotating the forearm while the patient's under anesthesia. If it's stable, then it, it will stay stable. Uh, if you feel it popping, then there's a bigger problem. In this case, it may be the ulna styloid, um, but uh, otherwise it's the sometimes the distal limb of the oblique ligament uh, of the central uh, band uh interosseous ligament i mean this little oblique band so that's a good way to test in both situations great great pearls um so you know we talked a little bit about bone grafting so i won't belabor it um you know one of the questions that came up was uh was bone grafting really necessary in this case um, there are some studies, this is a uh, systemic uh, review, like a Cochrane-type review, meta-analysis, looking at um, 2016, do we bone graft, do we need to bone graft? And, uh, Dr. Jipper alluded to the hinge type, and we'll talk a little bit about more hinge versus distraction type uh, corrective osteotomies. Uh, and the review actually demonstrated that uh, extra-articular malunited fractures of this radius treated with molar locking plates does not necessarily require bone graft. Um, 
I'll be curious, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I've i heard what Jesse has to say. Emil, do you ever not bone graft? Uh, no, I've, um, I've okay. used the tri tricalcium phosphate bone substitute. And, uh, you know, as, as Jesse said, it's such a low morbidity. Mm -hmm. uh, take one or two cc of that uh, packet back there. I don't think you can go wrong with that. Perfect. Okay. I, I'm the same way. I, I never not bone graft something, whether it be allograft or or, um, or autograft. Um, so another study that I pulled up that sort of highlights a, a little bit of this, and I'm going to share the study before I share the complication. <laughs> okay. So um, this is a study that was actually out of out of Emil's group uh, yeah. in California, looking at 60 patients who had... Uh, who had uh, fixation, um, and they they alluded they divided them into two two groups: um, distraction type, which is the type on the left where you just effectively hinge the uh, off of the glomerular cortex without distraction, and and uh, then there's the distraction type. This is the hinge type on the left, the distraction type on the right, and you can see most of them were hinge corrective osteotomies, uh, uh, and you can see the demographics of the patients. Um, uh, there was uh, about four uh, percent smokers in the distraction group, one percent in the hinge group, and smoke. Uh, I mean, smokers were three and three in each group, and diabetes was four and one in, in each group, respectively. Um, and they looked at a lot of. Uh, it's a really well done article. They looked at a variety of different parameters. They they tried. They compared the overall uh, radiographic parameters, which improved statistically uh, from pre osteotomy in both groups but uh, really didn't have a difference between each other with regard to both groups. Now, you could argue that the distraction type osteotomies are more challenging. They have a more severe deformity to begin with. So we're not really always comparing apples to apples. But And you could also conclude similar findings that the overall complication rate is substantial in these patients, and they're going to be higher in the distraction group. And this was what they noticed as well. The, more, the top three complications were delayed union or non-union. Um, which is which is uh, in you know can be linked to hardware failure, which is the third most common complication. And as uh, as Dr. Jupiter alluded to, tendon concerns are are a big deal in these patients. You know, uh, a uh, not too far along fourth is neuropathy. <laughs> so uh, keep that in mind as well. So um, and uh, of course with hardware failure or a delayed non-union, you'll see loss of reduction as well. Uh, uh, again, they were higher in the distraction group in terms of complication rates, uh, and uh, you can see 15 were uh, uh, in the uh, distraction group, which is a 62.5% uh, versus 27% in the hinge group, and um, they didn't seem to, to be linked uh, necessarily to age uh, or gender. Um, When we look at uh, patient, and this is an interesting finding, but I, I attribute it largely to the fact that there there wasn't a uh, enough numbers, and this is what they mentioned in the article. But you would think that the surgeons who had done more of these uh, would have uh, fewer complication rates, but they they were they weren't really able to reach statistical significance in this regard. They also talked about bone grafting, and, and they said that no conclusions could be uh, made related to the bone graft used. But uh, they, they pretty firmly, uh, you know, concluded that autograft remains the gold standard, which I think most of us would agree. Although, as you can hear from our panel, uh, many, uh, many times we're not using um, uh, autograft. And um, so this is our patient again. Here she is three months post-op. And... Uh, and I would ask, uh, you know, uh, she's holding her alignment. She's uh, had much improvement of her pain. Her ulnar sided pain is also improved. Um, and I guess I would ask uh, Emil, are you are you happy right now, or what are you thinking? Um, I'm I'm happy with the the looks of it, but mm -hmm. I'm worried about the the bone graft. It doesn't look like it's uh, any callus developing there. It is concerning, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, it looks like a little, I would I would call it right now, delayed union, perhaps. What do you think? Uh, Jesse, do you ever use bone stimulators in these patients or or 
Is there a role well, for that? Well, as I, that's what I uh, mentioned, that mm -hmm. the type of material, I'm not mentioning the manufacturer or mm -hmm. the name of it, but it 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 is not just like calcium phosphate. It, it actually has the material properties of a structural bone so that it unites it, um, but it, it, it will withstand load. And having had that material, I felt much more comfortable uh, with a gap like this. Gotcha. One, so the, uh, when you're looking at an x-ray like this, mm -hmm. see how it's radially translated, and she's osteopenic. Um, it's putting a lot of stress on that gap. Yeah. Okay. So... Uh, one might consider, it's always in hindsight, I would have put a, a radial plate alongside. Oh, good thought, good thought, yeah. And that would be uh, probably much more uh, supportive than a big gap with a poorly placed bone graft. Uh, Emil and, and Jesse, I've seen you both use the two-column plate. Uh, that's thought to be structurally stronger plate do you, do you lean towards that kind of a plate i know i know you also used one of the t plates jesse in your in your session or your your uh, case does it, does it matter if you use a t plate versus a two column plate you think in these cases or there just isn't enough science for, to know well for me personally mm -hmm. uh, no it it doesn't really matter <laughs> mm -hmm. because if it's not healed by the time um, the material is Mm -hmm. it's too much load it it doesn't matter it's going to fail at its weakest point it's not going to fail where the two columns are it's going to fail in this at the gap yeah you're right and as uh and here she is five five um, actually she here she is at seven months post-op and now she's fractured through the through the through the uh, gap as uh, jesse prophesized um so in this case, um, do you think, Jesse, uh, if a screw was placed here, do you think it would have held on longer or probably uh, wouldn't have made a difference? Uh, well, it might have, might have, but I'll tell mm -hmm. you the problem is mm -hmm. her osteotomy is done on the uh, volar surface, right? Mm -hmm. And she has a, can you go back one? Mm hmm Okay, so she has this bone graft placed, and it probably was a cortico cancellous bone graft. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What happens is, and I assume it was placed through a volar approach, what happens is that it, it's very hard to actually sculpture it so that it's fitting so much perfectly that it's uh, uh, supporting both ends uh, sides of the osteotomy and so it almost looks like the cortical side is probably uh, opposite the plate and the soft tissue part is under the plate and if it doesn't fit perfectly it's not bearing a lot of load it's a good point that's an excellent point um, as you alluded to very nicely, is that there's this race that's going on between the hardware failing and, and the bone healing. So, uh, and here we failed. Uh, the hardware failed before the bone could heal. Um, interestingly, what they did, and I'm, I'm going to try to move things along as we're sort of past seven, and I don't know if there's additional questions that have been sent out there. You know, but, there are um, a few questions. But um, they opted at this point, which I think was a lesson to be learned. They opted at this point to just hope that it would heal. They felt like we had bony contact here. She, she's back where she was, uh, and that was that proved to be a fairly fairly big mistake because um, she uh, is now nine months. Uh, here she is at nine months post corrective osteotomy, and this is the time that uh, we ultimately uh, was referred to us, but at this point in time, she uh, developed uh, median nerve symptoms. And uh, subsequently, uh, a couple weeks after that, uh, developed uh, an inability to flex her index finger. 
So now she has complications related not just to, effectively, we have like the top three of the top four complications, uh, are all four of the top four complications from MEO studies. <laughs> we, we have we have hardware related issues, we have non-union, we have median nerve problems, and now tendon irritation slash rupture. And it's uh, it's much more complicated now. And these are the intraoperative photos. Uh, this is, uh, of course, the median nerve here and um, the FPL, or I mean FCR here. Um, the, uh, the soft tissues over the plate where the fracture is, you can see. Um, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. This is the FPL down here. I apologize, not the FCR. So this is uh, this is uh, the uh, index finger flexor tendon that ultimately I repaired with a uh, uh, a uh, uh, an endoside repair to the FDP to the uh, other digits, and um, and ultimately uh, she ended up doing pretty good in that regard. Um, all right, Emil. So talk me through this before I show you how I fixed it. What, what would you do at this point if you're gonna if you're gonna uh, play this? Well, you know, yeah, I would I would uh, take the plate out, the original plate out, and mm -hmm. clear. Uh, my my feeling, the reason this whole thing fell apart is because the sometimes the cortical cancellus, there's not much not much cancellus in there. It's just solid cortex. So you yeah, and many times you put it in there, and it just it looks like a dead bone, hard cortex. Eventually, it, it fails because it doesn't heal. So. Mm -hmm. And I would go for a, a, a cancellous bone graft with a very stout, strong plate that would have a, a ability to hold. Many of the thin, um, low-profile plates is probably not the best for this kind of case. And uh, I'll try to uh, put some traction, get as much uh, uh, length as I can without uh, undue tension on the rest of the soft tissue. And... Of course, uh, you did. It looks like you did the carpal tunnel release. I would do the carpal tunnel release and take the pressure off the nerve. And uh, I mean, I used to. I used two incisions because uh, you wanted to use our old incision. Would you have just done an extended ulnar approach, you or Jesse? Would you have ignored the old radial incision? No, I would. I wouldn't because you already have an incision. I don't know. Go and give it like a centimeter or two centimeters sp sp uh, space. That's probably not the best. I would. Uh, I would use the old incision. Okay. Jesse, would you have done more of an extensive owner approach or would you just uh, done two incisions as well? Uh, I'd use the uh, original incisions. Okay. Um, so, I, you know, what I think is really helpful in these cases is these uh, these diameter plates. Um, and there's a variety of different types. So uh, there's three, five fixation proximally. And, and you could argue, Marco, you went a little overboard with, with the length of the plate. <laughs> And maybe I did, but um, in, in addition to uh, 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 structural graft, which I took from Iliac Crest, which it, one of the lessons I learned from this uh, panel is that maybe I'm over, overly, uh, I should probably consider some of the uh, allograft uh, uh, substitutes, uh, and I'll, I'll take that to heart. Uh, I did do a distal ulnar resection because uh, uh, I, uh, I was not, and hoping to get her out the length again, I was, I was, I was going. Her, this bone was quite soft when I got in there, and I was concerned if I jacked her out too much, I was going to uh, create other problems that might lead. I mean, one nice thing about her is she still has a fairly well maintained joint. Yeah. So, so if I could preserve that and shorten uh, the ulna, that would be uh, the the way to go. Uh, and uh, here she is at one month post op and. And here she is at five months post-op and ultimately at seven months, uh, I mean, nine months post-op. So thankfully she went on to heal. I mean, she's uh, still quite limited overall with regard to her her mobility, but she's functional and she had a good pronosupination. And um, so we sort of got, got out of that, uh, that mess. Um, any comments about that, Jesse, Emil? No, you, can't, you can't argue with success. Uh, one thing is, um, what, uh, you were fortunate that uh, her soft tissue was very compliant. Um, you're but, right. Mm -hmm. uh, when seeing some of the deformities like that, 
um, we call them uh, radial club hand or post-traumatic mm -hmm. club hand. And sometimes I put a distractor on uh, intraop to slowly distract some of the uh, soft tissues if there's um, uh, more uh, adhesions and uh, less compliant soft tissue. Oh, thanks for the advice, Jesse. Yeah, um, I was going to ask about whether X fixes or distraction fixers would be helpful and how often you use them. In your case, since you took the uh, ulnar head off, you're not obligated to go all the way up to where it was before. So that's an advantage. So you can be shorter and not put the soft tissue in jeopardy. Right, right. I, I, uh, I just have a few take home points. Uh, you know, these are challenging um, problems, whether they be, I think that, you know, we didn't touch, I didn't touch upon a complication of intraarticular ones, but I, I, one of the things that I thought was uh, uh, among the many pearls of Jesse's talk was uh, those radioscafo lunar infusions. I, I think they work pretty well in some of those where the cartilage is sort of uh, um, pretty significantly affected, and many of them can have pretty functional outcomes. Complications related to fixing these is not uncommon. Uh, you know, there there was a uh, there was this sense of there's nothing to these procedures for a while, and then this most recent article sort of highlighted that these aren't as easy as you as uh, the the literature is describing. These are challenging procedures, and a lot of the three D uh, technology that uh, Jesse highlighted it will be really helpful for for some of the more significant uh, uh, deformities to to try to plan appropriately. Um, and uh, be be prepared for plan A and B, as we talked about, I think, with the uh, with particularly, uh, you know, what to do with the owner side of the wrist. Uh, what do you do with the DRUJ? Uh, what if you can't get her jacked out? What if you start to cut through the bone? What are you going to do? I, I think about those uh, those potentialities and speak with the patient ahead of time about it so that they're not um, um, surprised uh, and uh, you're not in a situation where you're doing something you really hadn't discussed initially. Um, all right, I'm going to stop sharing here, and uh, thank you all for your attention. There's one uh, uh, common uh, theme on the, some of the questions that is being uh, brought up is, the, uh, what do you do with the postoperatively in terms of rehab? How long do you mobilize after the surgery, and when do you start uh, a range of motion exercise? Any, Jesse, have any comments? Jesse, I'll let you go ahead. And uh, I, I obviously uh, depends on a lot of factors. Um, uh, this, if your soft tissue is um, compliant and you have a nice closure, and you're not so worried about swelling or you've distracted too much, and you feel you have adequate fixation uh, support, I, I would I would. Uh, uh, make a post-op soft dressing and a volar splint for two weeks, and then a removable uh, orthoplast splint that allows some more uh, hygiene and minimal uh, activities. And then depending upon the x-ray, uh, about functional loading. But all the while, they should be working with hand rehab what you don't want to do is forget about the fingers and the hand. So um, be careful about too much swelling and work on mobilization of the fingers and work on forearm rotation. Um, amen, amen. One of the questions was uh, my most distal screw on the uh, on my last fixation is it uh, is too appears to be in the joint. Um, it, you know, if you get a lateral tilt view, um, you'll be able to see that uh, you're fine. Um, you know, that 30 degree tilt view, it, it can sometimes give you this impression that you're in the joint. Um, but I can assure you that that screw is fine. And I, I, I can try to pull up an x-ray that shows the tilt view. But uh, uh, it's uh, it's deceiving when you uh, when you get a straight lateral without the tilt view, but to get the tilt view and do that intraoperatively, that's very important because you want to know then if you're in the in in the uh, in the joint space. It's not so easy if you have a uh, screws in the radial styloid uh, mm -hmm. to the ulnar facet. Uh, you can do the uh, skyline view mm -hmm. help a little bit, but not so much for the radiocarpal joint. 
And uh, on the horizon is um, intra-op 3D fluoroscopy, which oh, is okay. give you a, a 3D uh, scan. And we have a series, uh, an international uh, study that we've done that, and they, they've been using it quite a bit. And uh, I'll allude you to a, a study out of Japan where they looked at post-op CTs of their cases. Okay. And many people don't get post-op CTs of the cases, but found between 40 and uh, percent of cases had a screw either penetrating the dorsal cortex or in the joint. And they started using 3D intraop CT and that in a smaller number, but they didn't have that problem anymore. So it's it's a good question they asked you because it happens more than you think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's uh, it's so uh, it's almost like robotic joint replacements. So having this this uh, 3D information can can yeah. keep you honest and and uh, you know we've all seen those complications where screws in a joint or penetrates the dorsal cortex. Okay. I guess there's one more question about when you uh, do an osteotomy and you have a space, uh, 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 when do you allow weight bearing on the wrist? Well, for me, it's uh, it's got to be healed. Yeah, I was going to uh, say three months is usually where, where I start to consider it. Um, but the, the, the x-ray gives, gives you the guidance, you know, the x-ray helps you and, of course, the clinical exam, but the x-ray is critical. Mm -hmm. You can always get a CT as well at that point if you're concerned or want to get them. But um. and one other question about what is the indication for distal ulnar resection in the uh, setting of malunion, and uh, whether you do that instead of the uh, corrective osteotomy or combined. It's an open question. It's very difficult uh, if you've got a rotational or uh, length problem with your uh, osteot with your malunion because stability of the distal radial ulna joint comes from contact pressure of the ulna head to the sigmoid notch. So if your sigmoid notch is um, not in the right plane, you may not have a good distal radial ulna joint function, uh, even if you shorten it. And uh, years ago, there was a nice study looking at um, the uh, uh, axis of the sigmoid notch in malunions and how that some of those cases, the sigmoid notch is, the axis is way off. So you really have to do a, a distal radius osteotomy. <clears throat> yeah, I think Jesse touched upon it. You know, getting the radius right is the key. Um, you know, there's other factors associated, you know, the, of course, the length is always an issue. How much positive variance can you accept after you do the correction? It's always good to get contralateral films to see how God made them so you can get an idea on how, how to achieve where you want to be. But, you know, the younger patients, you know, J Doug Hannell said this eloquently years ago, and I've always thought of it. Once you take off that owner head, <laughs> there's, there's about 8% of patients who who go on to have a miserable experience so i wouldn't willy-nilly take out the the owner or head particularly in a younger patient you know uh and that's something obviously you, you need to discuss ahead of time sort of what do we do if we can't get the radius where we want it should we shorten uh make sure the radius is right though and um um the patient that i had the 75 year old it was fairly straightforward that we would remove the owner head rather than do something more heroic uh, uh, to try to keep it um, individualized, sort of what I'm saying. Well, it looks like we already three minutes past our a lot of time. I want to thank you, Dr. Uh, Jupiter, for your great uh, presentation and participation, and Marco and, um, Arito, thank you, Jesse. for your great cases and, and contribution. And all our uh, audience that have been hang out and uh, great questions that they submitted. And I appreciate and uh, look forward to the participation in the next webinars. Thank you very much. Bye bye. bye. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Emil. Recording stopped. Have a good night, buddy. You too. Again. Take care. Bye. Thanks, Chris.
Thanks, Abby.